by saying I'm sorry. No justice! No peace! This is a black-owned business that's been here for generations. What we really should be talking about today is George Floyd's murder. We as a community have to step up and take our city back. Protest all you want. Demonstrate all you want. The minute you start damaging, the minute you start looting, I'm sorry you're arrested, and you're going to go to jail. If you know the history of America, you know that how this nation was formed was in riot and protest. You ever hear of the Boston Tea Party? What was so remarkable with the George Floyd protest was how quickly it turned when it came to the monuments on Monument Avenue. Heck yeah. Heck yes, that's progress. This generation say, hey, if you're not going to take them down, we're going to take them down. What I like about the young people today is that they're saying, we're not going to take this. People in the streets are arguing against systemic racism. That has never been done before. Do you know how many times I've called 911? Assault with a weapon and robbery. No police were allowed to come. The only explanation can be that the police have been instructed not to enforce the law. Mayor Stoney exhibited a total lack of leadership. I think a total lack of courage. You could see that when he confronted the crowds. He was scared. There's a long history of pandemics, obviously, in the world. They come around periodically. What is interesting is that there is also a history of after quarantine, a history of protest and often rioting. So it's a number of different factors. One is uh, that there is a sense uh, of being pent up and a sense of threat that is caused by that. And when that happens, that affects a structure in our brain called the amygdala. We actually have two of them, one on each side. And that's our threat response system. And we respond with fight, flight, or freeze. So we don't sleep as well, we get irritable, we're on edge. And then you add to that the quarantine. So when we're quarantined, there's nowhere to go. The pressure begins to build. Our usual pressure release for many of us is going out and doing something. We don't have that. The other pressure release that most of us have is we have friends and a support system. We can hug people, we can talk to people. We don't have that either. So the containment of it causes a buildup. And all of this serves as tinder. It's tinder for a fire. And then the match gets lit. And the match is an injustice. And the George Floyd killing was an injustice. It spread immediately. It was viral. And so suddenly, everybody is angry. Everybody is upset about this. People were already frustrated in that they, you know, couldn't go about, they couldn't move, they were not being mobile. All these folks are at home watching TV and they look at it while this officer has put his knee on the neck of Mr. Floyd for well over eight minutes, almost nine minutes. And he cried for his mother. And then to see other police officers watch, it's one of the most horrific things I've seen in my entire life. I think that America and the world was sitting home and for the first time we were all still, so we weren't busy doing our normal. And everybody saw that video and white America woke up and said, wait a minute, hold up, really? This is what y'all are dealing with? This, I can't tell you the white friends, my pastor, others who said to me, I had no idea. I just, I guess I was sleepwalking. But when that happened, that awakened the consciousness of everybody to come out and that really made a difference because people came together. If it's just black folks like me talking, people probably aren't gonna listen because it's not their experience. And that motivated someone sitting in their suburban Henrico home to say, I'm gonna go into the city tonight and march down Monument Avenue because 
it wasn't right. Uh, I think that's what made the George Floyd protests so unique, was that more Americans were at home watching television because they, didn't, they, weren't, they weren't out at Little League with their kids or they weren't going to a baseball game. All these people who are white are able to sit there and see this and have all of this emotion built up in them and then guess what? Suddenly there's this potential outlet around a sense of injustice, around a common enemy. Because I mean, we've had lots of deaths of black people uh, who have been killed by police. This one's different. It's the only one that had a quarantine. And the effect that that had, it was just like throwing a, 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 uh, a match into a, a, a room with gunpowder. I mean, it just exploded from there. Prosecutors say Arbery was killed February 23rd while out jogging, accused of repeatedly trying to box in Arbery with trucks, then shooting him as he tried to escape. Police used a battering ram to enter Taylor's apartment after midnight, believing it was being used by a drug dealer to receive packages. Four police officers were responding to a call about counterfeiting on Monday evening, but the officer doesn't remove his knee until Floyd's apparently listless body is rolled onto a stretcher. He was pronounced dead later at a hospital. So for the first time in African-American history, we went about four decades without having any national movement. There's a people that is hurting. There's a people that is crying. And if you're hurting my brother, then you're hurting me. And if my brother is crying or my sister is crying, then I'm crying too. We're doing this for generations. Again, we're not going to see change tomorrow. And we're not going to see it the next day. But we got to think about the kids. We got to think about the kids' kids. I have three black children and I love them with all my heart, and I want them to have the same opportunities in life as my white children. But what I like about the young people today is that they're saying, we're not gonna take this. We're not gonna take this. We're not gonna stand for this. Walk with us. You say you walk with us. I follow your tweets. I follow your social media. I comment. I repost. Why? Because you're going to hear my voice. I support your right to protest. You should be protesting. But I will simply ask you to have some specific goals and objectives. What would you like the protests to have as an end result? You know, you can, you can protest, but protests should lead to progress, and progress should lead to policy. That's just the way it is. Things are going to have to change. If not, it is going to get worse because we have to see community transformation. We have to see a coming together of the people in this city. Red, yellow, black, and white, we just have to come together and we have to come together on, on, on what is fair. We have to come together on what is, what is right. You know, we have to come together on this, what is just. My role has been being the change that I wish to see and not waiting for a politician or a government or a law or a statue to be moved. For, the, for, for change and revolution to occur. My dad, actually, he asked if we wanted to march with us, and I said yes, because uh, obviously this is a problem that needs to be fixed. You know, look, young people are known for creating noise, for organizing protests, but they haven't been able to take advantage of their true political power because they're still not showing up at the voting booth. They're still not turning in their ballots uh, in the manner that would get them true political power. Whether that changes this year, We'll find out soon. What I saw in those images is not the city that I, that I know, but also I take a step back and recognize that there's a lot of built up, built up pain in there, right? But that's not the way to, to treat your city, right? 
Like I said, two wrongs don't make a right. My heart breaks for Richmond and it breaks for the entire country because this is, this is a story that's gone on forever, unfortunately. You got a right, a right to, you know, protest whatever you want. You don't have the right to put your hands on other people's uh, belongings. Hey, this was full of, full of watches. We got your back. We got your back. At this point, these bad actors are hijacking the cause. After two nights of destruction in Richmond, the National Guard on standby and the governor has once again declared a state of emergency. Rounding the corner onto Broad Street by City Hall, the crowd had doubled in size and police were streaming in behind them. That's when police started using the megaphone and telling them they were out past curfew and needed to go home. We've just spotted this. It looks like there is a, what appears to be a car on fire. Uh, definitely you've been smelling a lot of tear gas in the air no matter where you are downtown. The police chief, William Smith, says that 233 people were arrested last night. That was the first night of the 8 p.m. curfew. We made no arrests whatsoever for curfew unless you were involved in violence and destruction of our city. Drone video shows police throwing a tear gas canister into the crowd. A protester lobs what appears to be a bottle filled with liquid at police, then more tear gas. I do believe that the tear gassing last night was unprovoked. She also believes an apology is not enough. I think that they have to acknowledge their part in everything that's gone on and how they're just as responsible for a lot of the violence and destruction that happened as are the people that actually did it. We don't want to hear from you. I want to begin today by saying I'm sorry. Don't try. Every peaceful Mayor protester Mayor should Mayor be Trump. allowed to peacefully protest. Me, That's sir. the bottom line. That is your right. And we violated that yesterday. Excuse me. We're not so we go organize, all right? We're going to continue marching peacefully. I promise you, all right? Have a good day. I love you. Let's go. Let's continue marching. All right? I cannot know the depth of your pain. But what I can do is stand with you and I can support you. Symbols matter too and Virginia has never been willing to deal with symbols until now. Richmond is no longer the capital of the Confederacy. I haven't been gone from Richmond that long, but in 2012, if you said you wanted to take down the monuments on Monument Avenue, you would be kicked out of office. What the George Floyd protests were able to do with the monuments on Monument Avenue is really quite remarkable. Within a matter of days, really, you had the governor, the mayor, taking action to remove these symbols that some believe are symbols of hate from the most iconic street in the capital of Virginia. They wanted the statues down. Northam wanted the statues down. Stoney wanted the statues down. A lot of people wanted the statues down. They just used this for an excuse to get them down. I'm glad they're gone. I'm so glad they're gone. As a Richmonder, a native Richmonder, I'm so glad that they're gone. For, for black folk and brown folk, these are figures of oppression. Let me go on record unequivocally saying that I am absolutely opposed to the taking down of Confederate statues. There's an expression in French, il ne pas quelqu'un avec au main. There is no one with clean hands. If we start applying a purity test, we would all just have to turn around, walk into the ocean, and commit suicide. There is no clean history, and there is no way to clean up history. Those statues were built at a certain time in a certain place for a certain reason. A great nation does not run from her history, and I want people to see, I want people to know that this was in fact who we were, that this was a big part of our history. But after Charlottesville, when I realized when those young men, which is what really stung me, that I saw young men carrying towards, these weren't old guys with, you know, beards and their hats and their rebel hats from, these were young, educated guys with torches saying we won't be erased. And when I realized that their rallying point was that Robert E. Lee monument and how they used that as a jumping off point for what ended in one young woman losing her life. It is outrageous that should have ever been any Confederate monument on public grounds, ever. 
tearing these monuments down, is that going to really make anything better? If I saw them marching from those monuments a mile, mile and a half, two miles over to Gilpin Court, been there since 1943 killing people, enslaving people since 1943, still going strong. If I saw them march down from those monuments or from the police station down to those housing projects, I'd say, yeah, maybe we are making progress. You're right. I mean, a place like Gilpin Court is a monument to slavery and racism, just like Jefferson Davis or General Robert E. Lee's statue is. I mean, the whole concept of that was to put a large amount of poor African Americans in one part of town. And in cities all over this country, mayors are starting to change that. What progressive leaders want now is everyone living amongst one another. That if you have a million dollar condo or a million dollar house on Monument Avenue, that a couple blocks away you have an affordable housing complex where people can live. That's the movement, but that movement takes resources, it takes time, and it also takes politicians standing up to the people who live in that million dollar home and, and say, you may not like the idea of, a, of an apartment complex going up nearby, but we're going to do it because that's what's best for our society. The systemic racism that exists in America today is the same stuff that's been there since the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and that's warehousing your poorest black citizens in these concentrated, concentrated poverty, concentrated illiteracy, illegitimacy, every problem, substance abuse, redlined. There's no grocery stores there. Um, Domino's isn't delivering there. They're just isolated. Six of them in Richmond. They've been there forever. Just these last couple of days, we've had like a n numerous, you know, killings. 13 days, 12 people. Like, come on, you know? So tr we have to do some work. We have to do some work. And it's gonna take more than just, you know, taking down a monument. There are no monuments in the areas where the killings happen. The monuments on Monument Avenue have nothing to do with that. They're images. They are symbolism over substance. And take them down. I don't care. Do something about the substance. Richmond police say officers were trapped by protesters at Lee Monument, referencing videos circulating on social media of protesters with bicycles and on foot blocking the intersection and throwing objects at the SUV. Stoney saying that he asked Chief William Smith to resign this morning and that Smith did tender his resignation. Smith was on the job as the chief of Richmond police for less than a year. Faith and community leaders expressed concern Wednesday in reaction to a group of protesters entering the apartment building where Richmond Mayor LeVar Stoney lives on Tuesday night. A police spokesperson introduced interim chief William Jody Blackwell, a 22 year veteran of RPD. I am proud to work alongside the men and women of the Richmond Police Department, both sworn and civilian. We as a community have to step up and take our city back because too many sit in silence. Officers move in, deploying tear gas and shoot pepper bullets to clear the street, according to witnesses. Clearly, Richmond needs a different path forward. These nightly conflicts cannot continue indefinitely. An unlawful assembly uh, was called uh, a couple of times. Uh, people refuse to, uh, to, to leave. And, and so when people break the law, we, we, we can't condone that. We absolutely love the city born and raised here. It's full of families, children, elderly, different populations. It's one of the things I love about the city. It's a special place. It was very communal, very, very quiet. I uh, always enjoyed walking around the neighborhood and, and felt safe doing so. 
um, but of course that changed um, on May 29th when the protests began. The protests primarily stayed that, that night uh, downtown around the police station. Police vehicle on fire in front of headquarters. Command, I just want to let you know that uh, as something's clear up, they stay off of Broad. There are reports of uh, shot fires and several subjects with guns walking up and down Broad Street. That was the first night that my wife and I ever felt a need uh, to sleep with a loaded gun beside our bed. Then the second night of the protest is when the activity moved all the way down Monument Avenue to Arthur Ashe Boulevard. And we saw many students. And they would assemble usually more south and then come up the median to convene at the Lee Monument. Um, but it was, uh, it was a tenor of excitement and movement and some anger justified. I'm out here for the younger generations. Martin Luther King Jr. got to this point for me just so I can speak. Now I'm gonna get to this point for him so his children and grandchildren can live. And we felt really honored and privileged to be a part of it and to live here and to be able to walk out there and have signs. And, and we were a part of that. And, and that was really an almost spiritual moment, if you will. We have all marched in our 20s <laughs> for civil rights and for against Vietnam and for against the Iraq war. So that feeling was familiar to us, but it has changed. The events have really turned into a way to create chaos. It became really um, clear that the North Median had a group of people that were, mm, I would say, very persistent. And that- Very is aggressive and violent also. If you go to the circle on any given night, you'll see a security force. And the security force usually wears a, a tactical ballistic vest with multiple handguns. They'll have assault rifles and they literally secure the perimeter. You're not letting me what? Go, go over there, go home. I can go there. No, you can't, you're not. You're not. People are scared. If you go there and you are walking your dog or out with your kids or you wanna just be on a sidewalk as a free citizen in the area you live in, you have to be extremely careful that you don't pull out a phone or a video or anything because you could face personal attack, a minimum verbal attack. Take your stupid ass home. Yeah, I happen to live here, you I don't. Do I do too, this ain't your world, you're in my planet. Take your dumb home, Keep record it. There's nothing you can do. Uh, a friend of mine was uh, beaten, severely beaten. Uh, Get a phone call at night. Will you come out and help? Someone's being attacked on the street at gunpoint. You also have a lot of different groups, and not all of the groups get along. And on multiple nights, there are fights between the organizations. There was one just a couple nights ago where there was an extremely aggressive situation between two groups, and then later that night, shots were fired out of a vehicle. This is where people live. This is a neighborhood. Families had children hiding in the back of the house and laying on the ground, the floor, as these groups came through. It's very... Um, intimidating and we just don't know you know what's what's going to happen what bad is going to happen to us and then to call 911 and no one will come because they can't is one of the most frightening things to experience it's something that I never imagined you'd live through in our country and that sense of hopelessness and real vulnerability is extremely frightening we having endured over a month of this, we finally decided that the city has failed at its most fundamental responsibility, which is to maintain law and order so that its citizens can live in a safe environment, free from having their property damaged. The city has failed to uphold the law in too many cases. And my wife and I decided we, we could not be sure that the police would be there to protect us. 
So we decided to sell our home and move, which we have now done. I don't want to leave because then I would consider that maybe we've lost. Well, and, and I never thought of it as a war. I really <laughs> never thought of it as a war. It's like you've brought the anger and the conflict to me. I felt in the early days, um, let's have a discussion about this. But that has, that has changed. Going to a man's house in an act of intimidation is not cool, in my opinion. We meet force with force. We will meet force with force. For someone to invade on the space where someone lives, it just takes all of this to another level. There's a constant deflection about who's actually responsible for this. You're my employee, Stoney. Northam, you are my employee. I pay your salary. You owe me and my neighbors and the residents of the city an answer, an explanation of where you have been and what you're planning to do. Who dropped the ball on this and what really needs to be said to that person? Mayor Stoney mm. for the city and no. Governor Northam. While I take issue with the way the mayor has handled the situation, I also take issue with the way the governor has handled the situation. Uh, we also we need to remember that the state controls Lee Circle. And on a number of occasions, I witnessed the, the Capitol Police just stand by while property was damaged in and around Lee Circle. Our role has been pretty much constant throughout. And you go out there and you will smell feces. You will smell urine. Uh, you see rotten couches and other furniture strewn about. Um, we get noise complaints. We get, uh, you know, a lot of different complaints at a lot of different hours. It's very frustrating. The night the group went through VCU starting at Monroe Park, that was announced on Wednesday. On Wednesday, the entire administration and RPD knew the time, place, and what their intentions were. And they showed up at that time, that place, and did exactly what they said they were gonna do. How could that happen? How could, how could Mayor Stoney let that happen? What we have seen in this situation is leaders being tested, absolutely, all over the country. Last night was not about a cause. That was about violence. That was about paralysis. People want to paralyze the city of Richmond. Unacceptable. I think what the mayor um, is doing, I think, um, I think that he's doing whatever he possibly can. Something like this, this has never happened in the country like this. Um, I think he's doing what, what he can do. We're in a mess. We are in a mess. And grown-ups have to step forward. The mayor can't be like Stoney is. You just can't be like that. You gotta be a grown up. You say, we're gonna, we're gonna follow the law, protest, get your permit, take care of your business. Um, grown ups in academia, where is VCU? Where, where are their emails going out to students saying, if you protest, you, must, you should do this? This is what the law allows. If, you, if you're a student and you're caught vandalizing or something like that, you're not gonna be a student at VCU anymore. Where's that? Because I know a lot of these protesters are BCU students. I have faith in our current leadership because I have faith in the one that I serve. And I believe that the one that I serve is able to arrest and, and change and shift anything. Even if that means shifting current leadership out of place. I want to step back and take a longer view. And, and when you said, who do you blame? Boom, President Trump came into my mind right away, okay? So he has been very vocal in some of his beliefs and he's dog whistles over the past three and a half years that, that really have energized a certain part so that you, you, you have this really a, a division in our country. I am excited about the fact that we will have a new chief uh, in Chief Gerald Smith. 
Richmond Mayor LeVar Stoney names a new chief of police. Gerald Smith takes office next Wednesday. He is a reform-minded change agent who I think is going to be able to bring the sort of uh, reimagining of policing and public safety we need here in the great city of Richmond. The crowd was outside the home of Richmond Commonwealth's attorney Colette McKeachin in the Huguenot neighborhood. Call for a list of demands from her office. Among them... Reform this definition of unlawful assembly and how it is broadly used against protesters. Yeah, and on this historic day, several thousand people coming out to the corner of Arthur Ashe Boulevard and Monument Avenue to witness the taking down of the Stonewall Jackson statue. Thank you, Jim! Crowds cheered as this more than 120-year-old statue no longer towered over the River City. We meet force with force! We will meet force with force! Three fires were set. Windows were smashed. He says officers arrested more than a dozen people who were illegally in Monroe Park after dusk Sunday night. All y'all are helping us right now by us being able to be here. People sleeping on lawns. Police say some stealing juice for their smartphones. Robberies, assaults, then this. Shots fired late Thursday night. tackled by an officer. He's trying to avoid capture. Okay, so at some point, the officer has to stop him in order to engage him, in order to arrest him. He was met with violence. He was met with dozens of police officers and received no care in the time that he was hit and then subsequently swarmed. While well, citing a potential conflict of interest, Richmond's top prosecutor has declined to investigate whether laws were broken when Mayor Stoney arranged for the removal of Confederate monuments. Commonwealth's attorney Colette McKeachin is asking a Richmond Circuit Court now to appoint a special prosecutor to look into it instead. Councilwoman Kim Gray, who is challenging Stoney in the upcoming election, asked McKeachin last month to investigate how Stoney handed out the $1.8 million contract. The company has ties to a business owner who's donated $4,000 to Stoney's mayoral campaign since 2016. Mayor Stoney says he didn't know who the winning contractor was or that he was a donor. My whole life I've traveled all over this country. We're a great, great people. We have broad shoulders. We'll get over this. When I look at the protests and I see more white folk than black folk marching, then that lets me know that um, there's been a awakening of the conscience here in America and here in the city of Richmond. I hope that more and more people have the hard conversation and say walking in the street is wonderful. What would it take to solve this problem? You don't have all the answers and I don't have all the answers, but we can get to a common ground together. I often say if I could sit down with Jefferson and Madison and Lincoln and have a drink with them, they would be stunned that it worked. A more perfect union is always being formed every day. So I'm very optimistic about where we end up, very. It may not be today, but I'm crazy enough to believe that it might just be tomorrow. I'm open and I'm hopeful, I believe.